I like the sound of turning pages. Not just because books are really cool things, but because it means that you all are finding your way there and we're reading these words together. This is a good communal experience. Becca's trying very hard to make her way there. A reading from Matthew. Now, when the human one comes in his majesty and all his angels are with him, he will sit on his majestic throne. All the nations will be gathered in front of him. He will separate them from each other, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right side, but the goats he will put on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who will receive good things from my father. Inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you before the world began. I was hungry, and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then those who are righteous will, re will reply to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a stranger and welcome you or naked and give you clothes to wear? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Then the king will reply to them, I assure you that when you have done it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you have done it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Get away from me, you who will receive terrible things. Go into the unending fire that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, and you didn't give me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't, you didn't give me clothes to wear. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. And they will reply, well, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or, or in prison and didn't do anything to help you? And he will answer, I assure you, that when you haven't done it for the least of these, you haven't done it for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. The Spirit is saying to God's people, you may be seated. Let the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We don't, in America, have a really concrete picture of, of what a king is. We kind of try, we tried very hard to destroy that concept about 250 years. Wait, how old am I? 241 years ago and some change. I was born on the bicentennial. I missed it by a week. But I was already three weeks late. So, we have a model of constitutional government. And sometimes that works better than others. I would go so far as to say this might not be one of the best times for our constitutional government. We don't seem to get a whole lot done. But once upon a time, and in certain places still today, there are methods of governance that are much more authoritarian. And that was the model of governance that folks around Jesus understood. That's what they knew, even though Rome at the time was, at least in word, a republic, a res publica, a thing of the people, work of the people. But it's very easy to take more authority than is supposed to be given to you. I think Donna gave us a very clear picture of, or pointed us toward a very clear picture 
of an authoritarian means of governance last week. You all remember what story that Donna shared with us last week? you guys remembering stuff. I couldn't even remember that it was last week this morning. It's been a busy week. The story of Esther. Esther was a young Hebrew living where? In Persia. There we go. Under the reign of King, let's see, there are two different translations. Xerxes, and another translation calls him, and we had trouble with this this morning because it sounds like you're going to cough something up, Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus took Esther as one of his queens, and there was a rule about speaking in the presence of the king. Do you all remember what it was? We didn't quite go into this part of the story. That's right. If you spoke out of turn in the king's presence, you were not recognized, and that was the end of your ability to speak. That was the end of your life. But Esther had a thing to say. She had something that, sh that needed to be shared. And so she dared. She went through the proper channels. She waited until the king recognized her. But even proposing that she, a young Hebrew girl, might have something to say was a very dangerous venture. We don't have the same sense of, of that kind of authoritarianism today. And I'm quite thankful for that, frankly. I hope you don't catch me trying to lead the church like that. I don't like being authoritarian. It doesn't fit me. It, it feels heavy and ill-fitted and bulky. You ever put on a coat that's just way too long and way too big for you? Maybe. It feels something like that except on the soul. Authoritarianism is not a thing that should fit us as Christians. Because the model that Jesus gives to us is very different. What Jesus calls us to is not taking authority and ruling it over people, but it's taking the authority of God who models presence through Christ, who models presence through the words of the prophets. Walter Brueggemann is an Old Testament scholar, a scholar in particular of the prophets. And he has, maybe not coined the phrase, but he's well known for using the phrase, the quartet of the oppressed. I think I've use that phrase from the pulpit here already, and you'll hear me use it again, I guarantee. The prophets, as Brueggemann sees them and reads them, are constantly pointing to a God who is on the side of the poor, the widow, the orphan, the alien in our land. A God who is most well Seen, most well observed as being on the side of the most vulnerable people in society. And here, very close to the end of his ministry, very close to the crucifixion, Jesus is pointing the disciples to exactly that same thing. Exactly what the prophets had said for a thousand years at this point that God's people are called not to some great authoritarian rule. That's not what the reign of Christ is. That's not what the reign of God is. But the prophets have and Jesus is calling us 
to the kingdom of God that welcomes all people. The kingdom of God that goes out from these very secure concrete walls out into the world to find God in the presence of the most vulnerable members of society. There's plenty of rhetoric in the world today that, that doesn't lead us in that direction. This past Friday, there was a terrible, terrible tragedy in Egypt. A Sufi mosque was attacked and an atrocious number of people were killed and hurt. God doesn't call us to work like that. God calls us to heal, to mend, to forgive, to reconcile. God calls us to love. And I would propose to you that every opportunity that we take to move beyond this gorgeous but very insulated place, every opportunity we take to be in ministry with some of the most vulnerable members of society, our neighbors, the folks we don't know, folks halfway across the world, Every opportunity we take is an opportunity to bring the kingdom of God today. We can tend to think of the kingdom of God as this thing that is still to come in the great eschaton, the great glorious coming of Christ in the clouds. But y'all, Christ is coming today. Jesus sent the disciples out. Disciples? 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 <laughs> Jesus sent the disciples out two by two and said, everywhere you go, in every town you go into, every house you go into, proclaim to them the kingdom of God has come near you. I think the tense of that verb is really important. The kingdom of God has come near. When Jesus goes into the temple, he says the same thing to people there. The kingdom of God has come near you. The kingdom is not in its full glorious reality right now, but it's coming. It's coming right now in every opportunity that we take. How could we miss those? That's the authority we're given. That's the kingdom that's coming in. It's a kingdom that is fleshed out in the love of Christ that reaches out without condition. That reaches out everywhere. That doesn't just expect people to come in because we open the doors up. But that goes out from here empowered by God's Spirit to make Jesus known and to find Jesus everywhere that we go. That's a pretty astounding calling. It's a pretty powerful thing to be able to do. I hope today that we take that opportunity to bring God's kingdom everywhere that we go. It's our opportunity to take. It's so simple. It's so scary sometimes. But friends, with God's power, with God's help, we can do it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.